make it. From the first recipe to today's various choices, hummus has changed colors and texture during its long lifespan. Where was hummus born? How did it change and why? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brigitte Ganan. Brigitte also wants to give you a copy of the book and thank you for the contribution. Hummus? Yes. Hummus is a soft puree whose texture fits somewhere between the fluidity of milk and the solidity of food. Its consistency evokes childhood and maternal care. Its subtle taste is a reminder of the early stages of our, our sensuous life, of our first learning years, before the discovery of other textures and tastes, before the complexity of a festive table, before the necessity of making any choice before the acquisition of any knowledge that is required to face life and its bigger turbulences. Eating hummus becomes a metonymy of early childhood and its first sensuous surprises. If according to Bria Savarin, the invention of a new dish brings more happiness to the humankind than the discovery of a new star, then blessed is the person who one day, somewhere in the medieval Middle East, invented hummus. Hummus is made with chickpeas, which originated either in Afghanistan or in China, but were cultivated since approximately 4,000 BC in the Middle East, some sources say 8,000. Today, most of the chickpeas come from two different sorts, the kabuli, a medium to large size white to yellowish grain, which was grown for thousands of years around the Mediterranean Sea, but currently also in North Dakota, Carolina, California, Canada, Mexico, Australia, India, and even Russia. And a smaller red or black or yellow grain called desi, cultivated in the Indian subcontinent, mostly used for chick chickpea flour. Called Um Leibin, the mother of two small hearts, in colloquial Lebanese when eaten fresh, chickpeas are sold in bunches by vendors in the cities and their suburbs on, and on small rural roads and can also be found in grocery stores. The chickpea has a rustic look and it requires some effort before enjoy, enjoyment is reached. One must press hard on the oval pod filled with air before it breaks and a small burst announces the pleasure to come. Chickpeas are mentioned in the epic of Gilgamesh as the hero takes some with him during the quest, his quest. Quote, they dug a pit in the sunshine, then Gilgamesh went up on the mountain. He poured his chickpeas into the pit. O mountain, grant me a dream. Unquote. The discovery of a tomb in Deir el-Medina confirms that chickpeas were part of the Egyptian diet as early as 1300 BC. And along with dried fruit, cookies, chickpeas are offered to guests during the Greek libations that followed the meals. We also find them in Rome and Pompeii, where about around the first century BC, different varieties were cultivated. The grains were sold dried and without pods on markets or fresh. It is also said that Cicero was named after it, as the chickpea was called Cicer Arietinum, either because his family was known to trade it or because of the word he had on his nose. In Byzantium, people considered it to be a wind-producing food. In the Abbasid era, among the ta'am muzawwar, in English simulated food, dishes Christian, Christian ate during Lent, there is an omelet without eggs. It's a chickpea puree mixed with onions, olive oil, murri, coriander seeds, black pepper, and ma'as summer, then fried in a pan with olive oil. For many centuries, the chickpea was considered to be a diuretic, also used to treat constipation, skin diseases, toothaches, hair problems, as well as to lower fever. Attested in the Middle Eastern folklore, it magically allows pimples to heal and helps getting over melancholy, especially if the 
different rituals happen in harmony with the lunar third cycles. The first res hummus recipe appears as Hemas Kisa in the 13th century Syrian book, Al Wusla ila al Habib fi Wasl Tayyibat wa Tib, written by Ibn al Hadim, a historian from Aleppo. A century later, several recipes appear in Kitab Wasf al Atim al Muhtada, which is an enriched version of Al Baghdadi's 13th century Kitab al Tabiq. Other recipes appear in an anonymous 14th century Egyptian book, Kanz al Fawaid fi Tanwih al Nawaid, translated by Nawal Nasrallah. All these recipes with little variations are greenish in color due to their ingredients. Some suggest garnishing the dish with chickpeas left whole or with crushed rosebuds, parsley, ground pistachios, cinnamon, rue, mint, roasted hazelnuts, and different spices. The recipes indicate that the texture allows a person to take a bite with a piece of bread. A century later, Suyuti, the author of an Egyptian book, Medicine of the Prophet, writes, the chickpea is for the body, what yeast is for the bread, as it is the warmth that heats its desires, the humidity that increases its semen, and the wind that inflates its veins. In 1885, Khalil Sarkis, a Lebanese author, gives us a modernized version of hummus in tabbal bazit. While its texture has remained the same, the simplified dish using the same ingredients as today has also changed its color. It is simply decorated with olive oil and minced parsley. The recipe that appears in the first modern Iraqi cookbook published in 1946, Recipes from Baghdad, calls for chickpeas pre-soaked in water with baking soda, then prepared with lemon juice, garlic, parsley, and tahini. In the last few decades, Hummus has been a point of contention between two Middle Eastern neighboring countries, Lebanon and Israel, which each claim hummus as its own. Their ongoing competition leads each one of them to prepare larger and larger hummus dishes in order to seal a victory in the, into the Guinness record book. And turning from a nationalistic battle around hummus to a more personal one, in Jerusalem, a cookbook by Otto Lenghi and Tamimi, the authors share the following story. In the old city of Jerusalem, there is a hummusiya, a simple eatery specialized in hummus called Abu Shukri. It earned the solid reputation of being among the very best. Suddenly one day, across the unpaved road, another Abu Shukri opened. On its door hung a sign, we moved here, this is the real Abu Shukri, creating confusion among the customers. It was Abu Shukri's son-in-law who had worked in his restaurant as a waiter who opened the new restaurant. But the following day, the old restaurant also hung a sign on its door. We didn't move anywhere. This is the real Abu Shukri. A few days later, on a new banner across the, the road, one could read, the real, real, one and only original Abu Shukri. And the two fought fiercely for years until a big food corporation manufacturing packed hummus for supermarkets decided to run a TV campaign to promote its product. That triggered the reconciliation between the two Abu Shukris in an event labeled the end of hummus wars. Referring to etymology, some authors take the, battles to, the battle to another level. Using the Hebrew root, chet mem tzadi, they believe that the chickpea dish is mentioned in the Bible, Ruth 2.14. Based on different theories, they suggest that the word chometz, vinegar in Hebrew, chimtza, chickpea in Hebrew, and hummus derive from the same root. Meir Shalev, an Israeli author, also mentions that the workers who harvested would have probably revolted if they had only vinegar to dip their bread in. Ignoring the Arabic meaning of hummus that refers to the chickpea itself as well as the hummus dish and the root of which it derives, roasting but also reducing in the early meaning of the root, one particular author writes that in Arabic as well as in Hebrew, hummus is a chickpea puree that everybody seems to enjoy. We will never know to which dish the author of the Book of Fruit alluded, but it wouldn't be wrong to think that the dish mentioned in, his, in this story might simply have been a cucumber bread and cheese salad, or a meat dish seasoned with bin or muri, both fermented liquids, or any dish with vinegar, as it is still cooked today at the foot of Mount Hermon, or even pickled vegetables. There are so many options. 
By claiming an old regional traditional dish as its own, a modern nation takes possession of a national symbol, projecting conquest in the eye of its own citizens and in the eyes of foreign nations, a story anchored in its newly defined territory. In the case of Middle Eastern conflicts over hummus, some Israeli manufacturers add the label authentic Arabic hummus in order to guarantee the authenticity of the dish, which is even worse. In spite of the ongoing battles, some Arab restaurant owners living in Israel believe that hummus is a means of bringing people together instead of dividing them. In their minds, the dish allows guests to converse on subjects other than words and daily aggressions. Perfectly balanced according to the ancient medical traditions and their humor theories, the hummus is at the same time dry, humid, hot, and cold. It offers simultaneously components from the earth, chickpeas, from the fire, garlic, salt, and pepper, and from the air, sesame oil. Soft, slightly acidic, and salty, this puree is at the same time kosher, halal, and among the dishes, among, among the dishes allowed during Christian fasting periods. Its ingredients play on contrast, the cooked chickpeas and the raw garlic, tahini and lemon. It provides protein, lipids, and carbs, as well as iron, calcium, magnesium, and other minerals. Scooped with a ladle, then carved with a spoon into a concave receptacle, the dish presents voluptuous cur curves, offering in its center some chickpeas left whole and uncrushed. These small, round grains swollen with water on which is drizzled a golden precious olive oil, also carrying an antique tradition, become an irresistible temptation that everyone secretly wishes to reach first and taste. Whether it is decorated with chickpeas, finely minced meat with fried pine nuts, or even golden fried pine nuts alone, the various textures of the dish seduce by their contrasts. Its sensuality provokes a gourmand impulse, and whether we dip bread in it, preferably still warm right out of the oven, or crunchy raw vegetables, the first hand to reach the golden treasure is always guilty of the attack. And whatever the manner or the speed, whether it's a controlled mov movement or not, this first bite always destroys the elegant harmony of the dish. Today we find this delicious dish all over the world and of course in Palestinian hummusiyas in Abu Ghosh or Abu Shukri in Jerusalem, Abu Hassan in Yaffa, Saeed's in Akko. In a fuel, a small shop hidden in the narrow roads of Middle Eastern souks such as Baroud and Tir, who serves hummus, fatte, balilam, sabha and fool. The dishes slow cook in old pots on incandescent coal at night. The shops open at dawn and close when the pots are empty, usually before noon. Those who have the time will eat it seated at a table with family or friend in a moment of conviviality that seems to be, to be a victory over the daily tensions of our hectic schedules. Often served in a small red or brown dish, a reminder of the earth's soil, this plate represents a fragment of the world on which one will concentrate the attention. A plate that seems to conjure the void, the missing and the hunger. A communal dish that is shared in an unconscious desire to seal a moment of happiness. For those who are in a hurry, students, workers or travelers, this product represents the substitution of a healthy meal. It has even found a place in some farmers' markets that offer Middle Eastern products, sometimes sold by weight or added to various sandwiches that are customized to please a clientele of all ages, concerned by their food intake as well as their pleasure. For vegetarians, hummus will be spread on a pita, maru, or lavash-style flatbread, to which will be added tabbouleh, fatouche, falafel, or any other available options, pickled vegetables, or herbs. For others, it, add ten it adds tenderness to meat kebabs, cube marinated beef, lamb, and chicken, or to the minced meat prepared for kafta. Some major food distribution companies offer their own brands along with others, and in a world where a growing lack of trust toward the big multi multinational agro-industrial companies is common, the simple, healthy ingredient of hummus gives consumers a sense of victory over marketing slogans. And by choosing to eat the simple food, one is at the same time caring about health issues as well as being in tune with nature. 
For these active and conscious consu consumers, this accessible product allows them to also integrate the slow food concept into slow food concept into their eating habits. It becomes a responsible, ecological, and unifying choice against junk food. It flatters the taste buds, gives both pleasure and the illusion of having time. And whatever the situation, every bite takes us on an unconscious journey. It is the illusion of a shared meal, a moment where nothing external is in control. And languid in its plate, hummus fulfills its destiny. It offers itself with no reserve to the impulses of those who are starving and to the gourmet waiting to satiate their appetites. Languid, but never at rest, the dish is in constant evolution. It is sold today not only blonde, but also colored with different added ingredients and flavors. Reddened by peppers or beets, tinted in green by a combination of spinach and artichokes or avocado, it unexpectedly meets the spirit of the first greenish original puree. It has become such a popular dish that songs have been written to praise its virtues and express the urge to devour it impulsively. Thank you. There is a tasting of hummus, of four hummus, different hummuses. We can take a few questions if you, if you wish while they drink the hummus. Uh -huh. Sorry. Nawal, you can help me also. We have also, yeah, of course, specialists. 